Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we're discussing the release of neurotransmitter. So, we're at the stage of trying to understand how we're going to liberate um, uh, synaptic vesicles which are attached to the actin cytoskeleton and are forming this reserve pool. Okay, so so far we've let in the calcium through this N-type or PQ-type voltage-gated calcium channel. It's bound to calmodulin to form calcium calmodulin complexes. And now what we want to see is how we, which enzyme is calcium calmodulin complexes going to activate. And the enzyme we're interested in is calcium calmodulin dependent kinase 2 or CAM kinase 2. Right. So I've told you the structure of a single CAM kinase 2 enzyme here, where you have this hub region here, uh, a linker region, uh, linking the hub region up to a kinase domain, which then has a, a pseudo substrate or an autoinhibitory domain sitting within the active site to prevent it from being active, basically. Now, <clears throat> And this is a single uh, CAM kinase 2 enzyme. However, CAM kinase 2 does not go round on its own. Instead, it goes around in a 12-membered oligomer. Okay, so I now want to show you the structure of that 12-membered oligomer, or at least draw a picture of the 12-membered oligomer. So, what happens is this 12-membered oligomer is actually formed from two rings of uh, six uh, CAM kinase 2 enzymes. So let me show you this in a picture. Okay, whoops, that's gone a bit off. Um, <laughs> it doesn't look very even, but basically what you do is you put um, six of these hub domains together, okay? And you create a ring of hub domains, like so. And what you do is you create two of these rings of hub domains, like this. Okay, and I wish that was here rather than there, but never mind. Okay, so you've got these uh, rings of six hub domains put together and uh, you've got two of these rings stacked on top of one another and then basically if I redraw out this picture of our cam kinase, well, actually I'll draw it on here basically each one of these hub domains will then have a linker coming from it so I'll draw this linker and then it will have its kinase domain up here okay uh, with uh, this um, pseudo substrate coming off and inhibiting uh, the kinase domain by sitting in the active site. So let me just colour in everything. So the pseudo substrate is here in pink. Okay. Uh, the kinase domain is here in turquoise. So the turquoise is denoting the kinase domain over there. Uh, the linker region I think we will colour in blue. So here's the linker which links the kinase domain with the hub region at which is um, the portion that is oligomerizing with loads of other hub regions. So this is one hub region here. Okay, so you've put together six of those in a ring, basically. So there'll be another one here. So let me draw out just to make it crystal clear. Okay, so here's another kinase domain here, another uh, pseudo substrate portion sitting in the active site of the kinase domain there. Okay, so I'll colour it in again. So here's the pseudo substrate in purple. Here's the kinase domain in turquoise. Okay, and then the linker region is this region connecting the hub uh, domain to the kinase domain, and that's in blue. Okay, and here's the hub domain of that one of the um, six there. Okay, so uh, you stick six of these together in this ring, and then what you do is you make another one of these rings and you put this below. So basically, coming, at, coming out from below, there'll be another one of these rings. So they'll be sitting, it's like just taking one of these rings, rotating it over 160 degrees and then sticking it on the bottom. So here's this other, um, other ring down here. Well, here's one of these uh, CAM kinase 2 enzymes from the other ring. So you have this linker region and then the uh, kinase domain down here and then the pseudo substrate from the linker region that's sitting in the active site, basically. So this is the pseudo substrate in the purple here, and the linker region again in blue here. Okay, and finally in turquoise the uh, kinase domain here. Right. Okay. Now, what's going to happen is uh, these oligomers exist 
in the cytoplasm of the axon. So these uh, oligomers, which contain these 12 calcium calmodulin dependent kinase 2 enzymes, or CAM kinase 2, uh, they sit in the cytoplasm of the axon terminal. And what's going to happen is when calcium comes in through the voltage-gated calcium channels and forms these calcium calmodulin complex, excuse me, calcium calmodulin complexes, the calcium calmodulin complexes are going to come and activate these oligomers of calcium calmodulin independent kinase 2, or CAM kinase 2. And basically what happens is that one uh, calcium calmodulin uh, complex here is going to come and bind to the pseudo substrate or the auto inhibitory domain of a CAM kinase 2 enzyme within one of these oligomers. So here is our, ca our calcium calmodulin uh, complex here, and it's come and bound to this. Uh, auto-inhibitory domain, and when it does so, what will happen is it will change the conformation of this auto-inhibitory domain and pull it out of the active site. So what will happen is if I draw this individual subunit of the oligomer out, so this individual uh, CAM kinase 2 enzyme out, then what will happen is the, uh, the auto-inhibitory domain will now change conformation and it will come out of this kinase domain. So it will no longer sit in the active site of the kinase domain. Okay, now, uh, very important for the activation of calcium uh, calmodulin independent kinase 2 is the length of this linker region because there are different variants of CAM kinase 2, basically, and they have differing lengths of this linker region. And if the linker is longer, basically, if you imagine this coming out really, really long, then uh, the um, auto-inhibitory domain will be more exposed, and therefore uh, calcium calmodulin complexes will have an easier time gaining access to the auto-inhibitory domain and causing it to change conformation and um, leave the active site of the kinase domain. Okay, uh, whereas if the linker region is really, really short, then the kinase will basically be on top of the hub region, and it will be very, very difficult for the calcium calmodulin complexes to gain access to the auto-inhibitory region at, to change its conformation and activate the kinase domain. So basically, the linker region, deter how long the linker region is, determines how easy to activate the CAM kinase 2 enzyme is. And uh, what you find is that uh, CAM kinase 2s with very short linker regions need very high concentrations of calcium calmodulin in order to activate them. And CAM kinase 2 enzymes with long linker regions will be activated at much uh, lower concentrations of calcium uh, calmodulin complexes. Okay, so this is how uh, the calcium calmodulin complex binding uh, to this auto inhibitory uh, domain here. So this is our calcium calmodulin complex here. Okay, this is our auto-inhibitory domain in purple here, or the pseudo-substrate as it's also called. Okay, and now it's changed conformation so that basically it's no longer in uh, the active site of the kinase domain. And I know I've drawn the kinase domain further up. That's what, that doesn't happen. Uh, but uh, I needed to draw it so that it was the pseudo-substrate was visibly uh, away from the kinase domain. Okay, now what this means is that this kinase domain is now free to, act, free to do its job, basically. Free to add phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues. Okay, so let me just remind you of the structure of a serine and threonine amino acid and how uh, you can add phosphate groups in phosphate ester bonds uh, to serine and threonine residues. Okay, so we'll start with the structure of serine. So serine is an amino acid, and so is threonine. So we'll start off with the basic amino acid structure. So here's the amino group of the alpha carbon here. The alpha carbon also has a hydrogen there, and then a carboxylic acid group down at the bottom. Okay, so that's the core structure of an amino acid. Uh, then the R group, which varies between the different amino acids. In the case of serine, you have a methylene group, and then a hydroxyl group off like that. So that is the structure of the serine amino acid. Okay, now let's do the threonine. So threonine, again, that will draw out the basic amino acid structure initially. So here's the amino group, the alpha carbon with a hydrogen off it, the carboxylic acid group down here, and now the R group of threonine. It's extremely similar to the R group of serine. So you have a carbon with a hydroxyl group off it, a hydrogen coming down here, and a methyl group up there. So this now is the structure 
of threonine. Okay, so uh, these are the two amino acids which can be phosphorylated by these kinase domains of these um, CAM kinase 2 enzymes. And the way that it works is if we bring in a phosphate group here, a phosphate group has a uh, phosphorus atom at the centre, double bonded to an oxygen, and then it has two hydroxyl groups off it, like so. And then it's singly bonded to an oxygen, which has also acquired an electron by a ionic interaction somehow, and therefore has a negative charge on it. Okay, so what you can do is perform a condensation reaction where uh, the hydroxyl group of the phosphate group is removed, the hydrogen of this hydroxyl of the serine or the threonine is removed, they combine together to make water. Okay, so this makes water. And then what happens is this oxygen here that's left over is going to bind to the phosphorus of the phosphate group in what's known as a phosphate or a phospho-ester bond. So this is a phosphate-ester bond. Okay, so phosphate-ester. Or uh, sometimes you'll see here people abbreviate it to phospho-ester. Okay. Right, so... Um, Usually, however, the way that these kinase enzymes add phosphate groups onto uh, serine and threonine is not by just taking an inorganic phosphate from the cytoplasm and binding it in this condensation reaction to uh, the serine or the threonine. Instead, what they generally do is they take um, an ATP molecule, the denosine triphosphate, they hydrolyze the gamma phosphate, the third phosphate group, off the uh, ATP and they stick that onto these hydroxyl groups. And therefore, the re energy released by the hydrolysis of the ATP then uh, satisfies the activation energy that you need to actually perform this uh, production of this phosphoester bond. Right, okay, so CAM kinase 2 is one of these serine threonine kinase enzymes which is going to add phosphate groups onto uh, serine and threonine residues. And I want to stress that even though the enzyme goes around in this huge, great uh, oligomer here, um, then it doesn't mean that um, each of these enzymes isn't functioning on its own. Basically, you have 12 of them that can all function on their own, basically. And in order to activate each one of them, you have to have a calcium camogenin complex binding to each one of their autoinhibitory um, domains. So just having one calcium camogenin complex activated on one of them does not, does not mean that the, all, all the others suddenly become active. You have to have all of them being activated on their own by calcium camogenin complexes. Right, okay. Now, once the um, calcium camogenin enzyme is active, however, what it's going to do is it's going to phosphorylate these synapsin proteins. So let me just remind you of synapsins. So when we were discussing the uh, reserve vesicle pool, we discussed that we had these synaptic vesicles which were bound to the actin filaments of the actin cytoskeleton. So if this is an actin filament here, these little blobs represent the actin monomers. So remember, actin is a tiny little globular protein that has to polymerize in order to form these strands. Okay, so it polymerizes to form these strands which are really important in the cytoskeletal structure of cells. And this is an actin filament. And basically, the synaptic vesicles were bound to the actin filaments by proteins known as synapsins. So we have this synapsin protein, which I'll draw in purple here. Okay, so purple for synapsin protein. Okay, so this is a synapsin protein, so I'll write that. So this is a synapsin protein. Okay, and on the other side, what happens is the synapsin binds to a synaptic vesicle here. So here's the synaptic vesicle, the membrane of the synaptic vesicle, and inside there are loads of neurotransmitters. So in red here, I'll draw the neurotransmitter as blobs. Right. Okay, so the synapsin therefore holds these synaptic vesicles that are in this reserve pool to the actin filaments. Now, what's going to happen is that when you activate CAM kinase 2, CAM kinase 2 is going to add a phosphate group onto this synapsin protein. So we're going to end up with synapsin with a phosphate group stuck onto it here. Okay, so this is our synapsin with this phosphate group stuck onto it. And now when you phosphorylate the synapsin protein, it no longer wants to bind to the actin, so it 
lets go of the actin, and also it no longer wants to bind to the phospholipid bilayer of the of the synaptic vesicle here. So it lets go of the synaptic vesicle as well. So basically, it cleaves both of these bonds that it's got, goes off and does its own thing, and that means that the synaptic vesicle is no longer tethered to the actin filament anymore. So the synaptic vesicle is released. This is what we mean by the liberation of the reserve pool. So this is the liberation of the reserve pool. So, overall, what's going to happen is when an action potential arrives in the axon terminal of a neuron, it's going to lead to the influx of calcium from the extracellular fluid. Calcium is firstly going to drive the actual membrane fusion of the docked vesicles or the readily releasable vesicle pool with uh, the uh, membrane of the active zone and therefore release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. In addition, what it's going to do is it's going to activate the CAM kinase 2 enzyme, which is going to start phosphorylating these synapsins and liberating the reserve pool, basically, so that these reserve vesicle, vesicle pools, well, these ve synaptic vesicles in the reserve vesicle pool can start making their way towards the active zone. They will then dock at the active zone, and then they too can begin the process of fusion. fusion. So, um, you do more, basically, than just uh, begin the fusion process when you allow calcium in. You also liberate the reserve vesicle pool. Okay, so that's now the process of actually um, releasing the vesicles. Uh, done now. What we now want to look at is how we recycle uh, the vesicles, basically, how we retake the membrane back out of the plasma membrane, and then how we uh, dissemble the, um, the coarse nair complexes, which are now cis coarse nair complexes.